Right. Good morning. Good afternoon to all of you. Uh, my name is uh, Araceli Fernandez. I'm the head of the Technology and Innovation Unit here at the International Energy Agency. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar on the 2024 edition of the IEA's Global Electric Vehicle Outlook, uh, where we are going to have uh, some of the principal authors of the report uh, that you will see soon on screen, uh, unpacking the key findings of our analysis. Thanks very much for joining us, and uh, we'll uh, keep waiting as well as uh, some colleagues will be joining soon as well uh, in terms of participants. Um, the report was actually released uh, earlier this week by our executive director, Dr. Fatih Birol, and our chief energy technology officer, Dr. Timo Good, uh, with a live stream press conference that was attended by more than 2,000 uh, people. And uh, the outlook was already received by uh, with a great press coverage with articles from Financial Times, uh, from CNN, Bloomberg, Reuters, or The Guardian, uh, among others, which has been really rewarding. And when we look at uh, trends and the current landscape, we see the rise of electric cars in recent years that has been extraordinary, and it has huge implications, of course, for the auto industry and the energy sector. Uh, something that I'm sure uh, many of you have noticed in recent months is all the bad news about electric cars. Uh, reading some of these reports in the media, you could find yourself thinking that the growth of electric cars has come to a screeching halt. But actually, uh, at the IEA, uh, what we do is to focus on, on data. And when we actually look at uh, the data, what it's showing us really is that, in fact, is that uh, the growth in electric car sales worldwide has uh, remained robust. Over the first quarter of this year, uh, global electric car sales were around uh, one quarter higher than the sales in the first quarter of last year in 2023, which we think is a very healthy growth, just considering the different observed challenges that have been discussed in these different media reports. So just if we uh, move quickly to the next slide, just wanted to emphasize that uh, now, of course, uh, this year again, we have produced the global electric vehicle outlook. Uh, once again, uh, with the support of the Electric Vehicles Initiatives, EBI, which is a multi-governmental policy forum established in 2010 under the Clean Energy Ministerial. And that's part of our role as coordinator of this initiative that they produce that report. Um, the EBI is dedicated to accelerating the adoption of EVs, electric vehicles, worldwide, striving to better understand the policy challenges related to electric mobility, to help governments address them and to serve as a platform for knowledge sharing among governments and policymakers. The EVI also has facilitated exchanges between governments, policymakers, and a variety of other partners on topics important for the transition to electric mobility, such as charging infrastructure and grid integration, as well as EV battery supply chains. And last year edition of uh, the Global EV Outlook actually uh, marked uh, the 10th anniversary of that uh, publication of that report, uh, which actually has been produced every year since then, since back uh, in 2013. Uh, the outlook is dedicated to track and monitor the progress of electric mobility worldwide and to inform policymakers on how to best accelerate electrification of the road transport sector. But let me express a special thank you uh, from the whole team to the EBI members joining us today for their support throughout all this process as well as the different peer reviewers that generously have been sharing their suggestions throughout the process of developing this report as well. And just before delving into the analysis uh, that my colleagues are going to be presenting very soon, let me just mention that we'll have a Q&A session after the presentation. Uh, so please post your questions in the Q&A uh, function or Zoom or in the chat throughout the presentation. So this way we can address as many questions as possible in the time we have allocated after the presentation by my colleagues. The slides as well, just as a reminder, uh, would be available on our website as well after the session, so that uh, you're aware of that. Um, and with that, let me just uh, pass the floor and uh, give it the word to my colleague Jean-Baptiste Lemawa, who will start the presentation of the key findings. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Araceli. Um, and I will start immediately illustrating some of the concepts that you, uh, you talked about in the intro, notably about this healthy growth that you, that you mentioned in introduction. So if we look at electric car sales over time, basically every year comes uh, with its uh, load of concerns. So in 2021, uh, there were concerns that after the, the, the policies that supported electric car sales in 2020, there were concerns that sales would actually slow down. But what we saw is that sales continued to increase in 2021, and they reached uh, around 6.6 .6 million. 
Then in 2022, there were concerns that geopolitical disruptions, supply chain disruptions, uh, high energy and uh, commodity prices were going again to slow down growth. But what we saw is that in fact, electric car sales continued to grow and they reached around 10 million that year. <laughs> and then in 2023, there were concerns that perhaps those sales in 2022 were in fact inflated, especially in China. And so there were again concerns that this could not be sustained when in fact, in 2023, sales were 35% higher than the previous year and they reached 14 million. So this year, again, in 2024, there has been some concerns and, and many of them are obviously legitimate, especially in companies and in, on financial markets. But the data still show that growth uh, is, is really well present. So in the first quarter of 2024, electric car sales were actually 25% higher than the first quarter of 2023. Of course, there's some regional uh, discrepancies here. In China, these sales were 35% higher than the previous um, Q1 in 2023, just 15% in the US and 10% in Europe. But across the board, the message here is that you can see the first quarter of each year. And every single time, it is a little bit lower than the previous quarter uh, at the end of a year. But in fact, the trend is towards increasing electric car sales. So with these trends in mind, we expect 2024 to actually show very healthy growth. And we expect sales to reach around 17 million in 2024. That would bring us to a sales share of just over 20%. So over one in five cars sold globally would be electric. And that's just up from about 18% in 2023. Once again, there is some regional um, variation here. As you can imagine, in, in China, we expect that the sales share could be around 45%. In the US, uh, that could be 11%, and Europe slightly higher, 25%. So as you can see on this chart, there is still a significant concentration of uh, electric car markets in China, Europe, and the US. But these markets are really mature. And in a second, I will be talking about what's happening beyond these, uh, these usual suspects. But before that, I would like to maybe emphasize what this regional concentration means uh, for the car industry. If you look at conventional cars, basically in 2023, around 10% of these were sold by Chinese companies, while the rest of them were by major incumbent car makers in, in Europe, in Japan, in, in the US, and in Korea, as you can see on, on this pie chart. But now if we switch the picture to the electric, we can see that the share of Chinese car makers is far higher. Of the 14 million electric cars that were sold last year, around 55% actually came from Chinese car makers. So as we know, most sales take place in China in the first place, right? So in China, 80% of the electric car sales were by Chinese car makers. So perhaps this pie chart at the global level is still a bit skewed towards China, but still this emerging car industry in China has very, very important implications for the rest of the world. Now, if we look, and I, I mentioned this just a second ago, beyond China, Europe, and the US, the three major electric car uh, markets, interestingly, sales are really jumping um, in 2023 in emerging markets and developing economies. So for example, in India, uh, last year in 2023, sales were up 70% year on year. Uh, sales quadrupled in Thailand. Um, and in Vietnam, a few years ago, sales were, were practically zero, uh, and, and they have increased very quickly as well. In India, now the sales share of electric cars is around 2%, which can seem not so high when, when you just look at the number. But when you consider the size of India's economy, this number is considerable. And then for smaller economies like Vietnam, 15% of all electric cars, of all cars sold were electric, when the actual conventional car market contracted. And then in Thailand, a very impressive 10% share as well. And you have similar trends in Indonesia and in Brazil, Mexico, but also other countries. Now, what's interesting is that when you look at uh, these countries, there's really two stories emerging. And so here on the screen, what you can see is in green, domestic car makers, and in red, Chinese car makers. So the first story is, for example, in India and Vietnam, where domestic car makers are really the front runners, and when supported by policy and investment, they build domestic capacity and they account for a big share of the, of, of the sales. In India, for example, 
uh, Tata and Mahindra account for 80% of the cumulative sales since 15 years ago. And Vietnam Vinfast, which is a, a company that didn't exist just six, seven years ago, uh, now actually accounts for all of the sales in Vietnam, nearly all of the sales. And last year it went public and it's, uh, and it's actually trying to develop, produce and sell electric cars in the US now. The second story is a bit of a different one. And this is what you see in Thailand, Indonesia, but also other countries. And it's a story in which the arrival of Chinese car makers with cheaper models is what enables electric car sales. In Thailand and Indonesia, for example, two companies, Hozon and Wuling, arrived with a new model in 2022, far cheaper than alternatives. And these became best sellers immediately. So in 2023, uh, basically 75% of the sales were by Chinese <laughs> brands. Uh, and in Indonesia, it was about 60% on average in the last two years. And again, it's trends that we can see elsewhere. And these two different strategies are helping boost sales, but also have different implications for the domestic industry. And with that, I will um, hand to Shane, who will speak about electric uh, car markets secondhand. Thank you very much, JB. <clears throat> so we're looking uh, at secondhand markets here now, and we realize that both in emerging and in advanced economies, <clears throat> excuse me, many people are more likely to buy secondhand car rather than a new one. In fact, in the European Union, about 90% of low and middle income earners buy their car secondhand. And in the US, this number is about seven out of 10. Um, less than 20% of lower income households in the United States actually consider purchasing a vehicle new. And the secondhand market can therefore open up opportunities for more people to go electric. If we look at China, the most advanced secondhand market, um, sales of secondhand vehicles increased by over 40% in 2023 and now represent about 4% of all used car sales. Um, that's almost 800,000 secondhand vehicles, uh, and it represents about 10% of all electric vehicles sold in the country in 2023. Moreover, the average cost of the secondhand electric vehicle in 2023 was around 11,000 US dollars, which is less than half of the sales weighted average of a new electric vehicle. If you look towards Europe, in the six countries analyzed and shown on the bottom of your screen, it's quite common that these cars are first leased by a company, and then after about two to four years, they enter the secondhand market. Uh, used EVs have a lower resale value relative to their purchase price uh, when compared to conventional vehicles, but this gap has been shrinking as the secondhand market has matured. With respect to the United States, the electric secondhand market has also been, also been growing steadily. Here we've seen the overall EV resale value uh, approach 25,000 US dollars. Uh, which means it's staying under the cap uh, for which the cars remain eligible for a $4,000 uh, tax rebate. So essentially, the second-hand vehicle prices are approaching the, the cap. And to put these volumes in perspective, this is about 1.5 million used electric vehicles sold last year in these three markets, and that is about the same as all new electric sales in the US. As these domestic second-hand markets mature, we expect the export of used vehicles internationally to see an increase as well. And that brings me nicely to our, our used vehicle flows. So many emerging economies have been importing used uh, internal combustion vehicles for decades. And traditionally, the biggest exporters have been Europe, Japan, the United States, and Korea, which makes sense given that this is where the, the major conventional car makers are located. The main destinations for these used vehicles are Africa, Asia, and Central and South America. The United Nations Environmental Program estimates that Africa alone uh, accounts for 40% of all used vehicle imports worldwide. However, we expect that electric used vehicle trade flows will look very, very different from this. Most notably, we expect China to play a larger role in used electric vehicle exports. Before 2019, exporting used vehicles was forbidden in China. This has since been changed with uh, some cities now allowed to export. And already in 2022, we see this impact. We see about 50,000 used electric vehicles were exported from China, uh, with the main destination being the Middle East. For emerging economies to take advantage of the growing secondhand electric car market, their governments must uh, make a number of considerations. One is to build up the skills capacity needed to provide the specialist servicing EVs require um, and to extend the EVs uh, lifetime. <clears throat> the second is to create recycling facilities and to ensure adequate end-of-life strategies for EV batteries. And lastly, and also very importantly, 
uh, these countries will need to support the rollout of charging infrastructure. <clears throat> so today we estimate that about 65% of charging in terms of the electricity consumption takes place at home or at the workplace, so private charging, and there are nearly as 10 times as many private chargers as there are public chargers. However, building the consumer confidence and comfort needed for mass adoption of EVs requires the development of an adequate public charging infrastructure. In mature markets, such as Norway, we expect to see the number of EVs per public charging point increase. Here, it's indicative of higher utilization rates of the infrastructure. So we have more chargers have been built across more of the country, servicing more electric vehicles. However, the same trends in less mature markets, such as the United Kingdom or the United States, can indicate that public charging infrastructure rollout is not keeping pace with EV sales and may hinder further uptake. The greater share of consumers that are yet to adopt EVs in these countries may not have access to private charging at home, and so allowing the ratio to rise like this too early in the transition will negatively impact the consumer experience. In countries with more dense urban populations, such as China and Korea, the relatively low access to private charging means that the quick rollout of public charging is even more important. Keeping the ratio of vehicles to chargers low during the transition is key, and we see that China has been particularly successful in this regard, despite the huge growth in EV sales and stock. Um, I'm handing over to my colleague now, uh, Jules. Thanks, Shen. Uh, so before we delve into our uh, affordability analysis, uh, let's take a moment to grasp two factors that have a very big influence on the price of electric cars. Uh, the size of the car first, and then second, the battery type. The electric vehicles are no exception to the global SUVification of cars, and over the years, they've been getting bigger. In fact, SUVs now make up nearly half of all electric car sales, and this is a significant leap from just 20% uh, five years ago. But even though EVs are getting bigger, their price tags are shrinking. And while this is in part thanks to an increasing competition in EV markets, this is also due to a remarkable shift in battery chemistry. Indeed, as you can see on the uh, right-hand uh, side of the slide, uh, the LFP uh, chemistry accounted for less than 5% of global EV sales five years ago in 2019, and a number that reached almost 40% uh, last year. That went even higher uh, in China to 60%. And given its lower manufacturing cost, this rise of LFP, LFP battery chemistry in global EV sales significantly contributed uh, to the uh, EV price global increase. So now let's take a closer look to the affordability of EVs. As we know, the electric car price is driven by its battery size, but also by uh, the market competition intensity that plays a critical role. Um, with that in mind, we could have a look at what the data tells us in the three major EV markets. In the US, for example, uh, the electric SUV prices fell more quickly than battery prices indicating that the battery, battery is not the only driver in the EV price decline. The recent price cuts by Tesla and other major uh, Chinese uh, EV manufacturers, as reported in the news last week, uh, suggest that the EV makers may have greater flexibility to adapt to an increasingly competitive industry landscape. When we look at electric SUVs in China this time, this proves even more compelling as their battery size increase is also causing their battery price to increase, but without necessarily affecting the vehicle purchase price in return. Um, instead, the electric SUV, uh, SUVs in China, they, they saw their price decrease uh, 25% despite their um, battery price increasing. In China, like in the US, by the way, the electric SUVs belong to the uh, market leading vehicle category, uh, thus experiencing the highest level of competition, thereby pushing manufacturers to cut prices beyond what's made possible by uh, the better prices for that. In Europe this time, uh, the small electric cars and the SUVs prices uh, followed a trend that is similar to that of the US, although having a lower average purchase prices. However, uh, the medium-sized electric vehicles saw, saw their retail price increase following their battery size increase. And this is likely because of the lack of market competition with it within this very particular sector. But those decreasing EV price trends, we saw 
just that they obviously translates into more affordable EVs, but that doesn't mean uh, anything when not compared when not comparing them uh, to their equivalent combustion equi uh, counterparts. And to assess how much those EV price cuts have improved their affordability, we show here the sales weighted average of EV premiums relative to their IC equivalents by segment. In this figure, we see that in 2022, um, for the US, the increased competition, the decreasing battery prices and economies of scale all contributed uh, to the remarkable decrease uh, of electric SUV premiums uh, in the US. But despite uh, this uh, decreasing EV trend, EV price trend, sorry, uh, the US remains uh, one of the major EV markets with the highest price premiums uh, for EVs when compared for, uh, against China, for instance, or, or Europe. In China this time, the staggering improvements in EV affordability have been achieved over the five last years. In 2022, our data indicates that small electric cars were on average 40% cheaper than their conventional equivalents. This is an EV affordability level that is only seen in China. Overall, in 2022, uh, the average price of an electric vehicle in China was 14% lower than the average Chinese uh, conventional car. In absolute terms, um, this looks even more striking as more than 60% of all the EVs sold in China last year were cheaper than their average uh, conventional equivalents. Those unique numbers are helping basically to sustain the EV uptake in China as uh, the national subsidies are slowly being phased out. In Europe now, quickly, uh, the EVs are generally, generally more affordable than, the, uh, than in the US, but this, they are still more expensive uh, than in China. In 22, for example, uh, 2022, sorry, for example, we estimate that without subsidies in Germany, um, the medium-sized uh, EVs sold uh, of, over 40% of, of them were cheaper uh, than their average equivalent. But when we look at total German EV sales, uh, only one in four EV sold was cheaper than its conventional equivalent, just to give you a bit of perspective. Uh, another interesting trend in Europe is that, as opposed to the US, uh, the affordability of small and medium-sized electric cars is set to further improve in the coming years because of the many new electric models that are expected to enter the market, but also thanks to the uh, growing competition between European car makers uh, um, and the forthcoming one uh, with the Chinese audience. Now, um, cars are not the only individual transportation <laughs> mean for which affordability is crucial. In emerging and developing economies, two and three wheelers are moving around more people than cars, uh, therefore stressing uh, the importance for, of making electric models uh, as accessible as possible to mass market consumers um, to ensure a rapid and effective uh, transport decarb decarbonization uh, for this uh, transport mode. When looking at, when looking at electric wheelers in India, for instance, uh, in China, sorry, uh, the figure shows uh, that despite their upfront purchase price uh, being 20% higher, uh, the electric models turn out being 20% cheaper than their IC counterparts after five years of ownership. And this is thanks to the fuel and maintenance cost uh, saving potentials that are offered by uh, the uh, electric wheeler models. In India this time, uh, the long-standing Fame 2 subsidy came to an end last month, uh, being replaced by a transitional scheme called the EMPS and dedicated to continuing the electric fuel uptake in this country. Um, in our analysis, uh, considering the sales-weighted average purchase prices of electric models against their uh, conventional equivalents, uh, we estimate that their TCO end up being 20% cheaper after five years of ownership, and this number even goes up to 40% when uh, we consider the set of financial incentives uh, that is in place uh, in India right now. This uh, comparative advantage in terms of TCO for electric wheelers is a compelling data, uh, ensuring that the electrification of this mode of transport will continue to grow in the future steadily. Um, with that, let me hand over to my colleague, Elizabeth, and we'll provide you with a, an exciting preview of uh, what's to come in the world of uh, electric vehicles. Thanks, Jill. Right, so I must say our outlook to 2030 and 2035 even remains a very positive one. So this is on the basis of underlying market trends such as affordability increases, as well as supportive policies and industry investments. And this EV transition will have implications for the car industry and energy markets. 
Today, electric car sales are high, uh, but there's kind of naturally some delay in seeing car sales um, or car cars in the fleet become electric. And so um, today we see about 8% of the cars in China are electric. In Europe, this is 4%, and in the US, this is around 2%. But as a result of increasing sales over time, we project that even under current policy settings, more than 30% of the cars on the road in China could be electric by 2030. In the European Union, the share of electric cars on the road could be nearly 20% in 2030, and in the US, could be over 15%. And the more electric cars we see on the road, the greater impact there will be on oil demand. In 2030, under current policy settings, over 4 million barrels per day are displaced just from electric cars. We see another 1 million barrels per day can be displaced by electric vans and trucks, and nearly another million is avoided through the use of electric buses and two and three wheelers. So together, that's 6 million barrels per day avoided in 2030, which is more than the total oil consumption for road transport in China last year. And so, as you can see, the electrification of road modes, even outside of cars, is important for meeting climate targets. And in fact, when looking at stock shares, uh, we see two and three wheelers are currently the most electrified road transport segment and are expected to remain so. In particular, as mentioned earlier, we see uh, two and three wheelers grow strongly in India, given the subsidies offered there um, that help reduce the purchase price, as well as the competitive total cost of ownership. Looking at buses, we also see this segment being more electrified than cars today um, in terms of the kind of share of on-road fleet. This is thanks primarily to sustained electric bus sales in China, where 50% of large bus sales um, have been electric since 2016. To 2030, we expect electric buses to become more prevalent outside of China. Uh, in particular, there are funding uh, programs in India and many Latin American countries that we expect will expand the fleet of electric buses there. And in the US and the European Union, uh, recent heavy duty emission standards will work to increase electric bus and truck sales. In fact, electric truck sales are expected to reach around 20 to 30% sales uh, in these major markets. So that's China, US, and EU. Uh, this would bring the global stock share to around 3%. And while that's certainly lower than we expect for other segments, I think it shows impressive growth, reaching a similar stock share as what we see for cars today. Of course, all of these electric vehicles will also mean growing demand for batteries and critical minerals. So here, I'll hand the floor over to my colleagues to discuss the outlook for batteries. Thank you, Elizabeth. So yeah, moving to the core technology behind electric vehicles, so battery, battery demand grew very significantly in 2023, and particularly 45% year on year, driven by higher EV and stationary storage sales. To give a sense of the scale they've reached, in 2023, the monthly battery demand was about the same as the entire 2017. Electric cars accounted for most of this demand, about 80%, while battery storage for another 10%. And the rest, so two free wheelers, buses, and trucks, were between 2 and 3% each. In the stated policy scenarios, battery demand in 2030 is set to expand four and a half times compared to today, with average monthly battery demand close to the demand in the entire 2021. In the same year, electric cars still account for the larger share of demand with about 75%, but demand for electric trucks grow rapidly thanks to higher shares and bigger battery size and reaches 8% in the same year. Close to the global battery demand for stationary storage that remain the second source of demand with 10%. Today, the three main markets, so China, Europe, and United States, remain the main drivers for demand and account for over 90% of it, with China alone accounting for about half of demand in 2023. However, in 2030, the rest of the world reached about 15% of demand, so significantly higher than today, and under current policies, and over 20% if all announced pledges are fulfilled. And 20% <laughs> is about double today's share, that give a sense of how rapidly the rest of the world will also follow the electric vehicle transition and stationary storage transition. Moving from demand to production, production 
follow demand with a growth year on year of 45%. And however, today, battery manufacturing capacity, if used at 85% utilization factor, will be able to produce 2.5 times more batteries compared to what we produce in 2023, with over 85% of this extra manufacturing capacity being located in China. And if all committed manufacturing capacity from now to 2030 will be built, then the and use at 85% utilization factor, then the production of battery will be in line with. APS demand in China and the European Union, and almost in line with the United States. If all the announcements will be built fully, including committed and preliminary plans, then the maximum, the maximum battery production will be largely sufficient to serve the domestic demand of these three main regions. Outside of those, however, the maximum battery production will serve only half of the demand. Therefore, there is opportunity for many countries in the world, such as India or Southeast South American countries, to build new manufacturing capacity to serve domestic markets or to establish favorable trade relationships with countries having enough battery or EV manufacturing capacity to serve their demand. On a global level, current and committed battery manufacturing capacity will be sufficient to cover the APS demand in 2030 and over 90% of the NZD demand in the same year, indicating that battery producers stand ready to fulfill our collective climate ambitions. However, of course, there are significant regional differences as underlined, and the main challenge for Chinese producers will be to find enough export market to utilize their manufacturing capacity, while the main challenge of European and American producers will be to scale up and demonstrate to be competitive on the uh, Chinese market. And that's not only a matter of building the battery cell, but also to establish the whole supply chains, just to give a sense of the challenge. Today, China accounts for practically all anode and active material and LFP production capacity, and over three quarters of global NNC production capacity, which underlines the need to close attention for this part of the battery supply chain. And with this, I end over with uh, Apostolos to discuss uh, some of the findings from the IA Battery Special Report published earlier today. Thank you, Pell. Hello, everyone. So taking a little bit a step back and looking battery as technology, so what it managed battery to, to serve for the energy system? First, it has managed to go together two sectors that traditionally would not interlink each other, namely transport and power. And we're talking for a market in monetary terms that it's 120 billion today. And given that already what Theo presented before in terms of the growth on volumes, this will reach in a market that is 30, 330 billion in 2030 under the current policy scenario steps, which is equivalent on amount of money that was spent last year in oil production. And this goes even further on NZD scenario, which is a scenario that puts the world on track on 1.5 degree scenario that it goes nearly to 500 billion US dollars. Of course, this is not only the market size of technology itself, but also it's a master key technology for unlocking and transforming different other industries out there. For example, automotive industry is trans transforming. We have seen already before from Zambatis presenting the key trends of automotive industry that today accounts for $4 trillion. And also it unlocks a further potential on power sector where we see wind and solar investments under NZD scenario cumulatively from today until 2030 to be $6 trillion. So technology is, better technology is going to support a massive transition there. And putting that in perspective of what is the impact of the technology itself on the energy sector in terms of CO2 emissions, we see that and we had assessed that it directly enable, make the job on closing the gap between steps, which is our reference scenario versus NZD, which is scenario 1.5 degrees. It makes around 60% of the, of the job from which the 60%, 20% is directly linked 
to batteries. I'm talking about EVs and also battery enabled renewables, mainly solar PV installations. And another 40% it comes from indirect link due to the fact that we have faster electrification on other end use sectors and even further deployment of renewables. Of course, what is key to put on perspective here is that if we don't manage to scale up the batteries there, there is a big amount of renewables that are, will be at, at risk. We assess for 2030, it will be around 500 gigawatt, mainly solar PV installations. And this will not put us on, on track in order to reach carbon neutrality by 2030. How batteries manage to fulfill the different COP28 pledges that already we have put in on the table. At first, namely the tripling of, of renewables. Of course, batteries are going to support the increase of, of renewables. Tripling, this is what has been stated of COP2 under COP28. And this, it leads a six-fold increase on energy storage. Most of this increase it comes from batteries, 95% of, of this increase. Of course, we have pumped hydro and other different technologies for providing energy storage applications there. But most of the growth it comes from battery storage, from which we need to increase 14 times the volumes from today levels by 2030 in order to fulfill this target. This job, it happens from both utility scale batteries and also behind the meter. We have already seen a growing market there, specifically in China, in, um, in the US also, and also in, in Germany in terms of solar PV installations at houses paired with standalone with battery applications there. And all of that, it, it brings us on the perspective that what is needed to be done in order to support this tripling of renewables, apart from this tripling of renewables, of course, electrification and specifically batteries support also quite considerably the doubling of energy efficiency goals and also supports the transition away from oil. And now I will pass to my colleague Shane talking about life cycle analysis. Thank you, Apple. So as part of this year's publication, we took a closer look at life cycle analysis at the level of the individual vehicle. So using 2023 global average values, we see that though producing the car and the battery are energy and material intensive processes, the driving cycle dominates the life cycle emissions for all powertrains. For ICEs, this is over 90% of the emissions coming from fuel production, which is our well to tank, and fuel combustion, which is our tank to wheel. For VEVs, it's around 60% uh, from charging the battery. So the much greater efficiency of an electric powertrain can therefore, in general, quickly pay back the additional manufacturing emissions associated with electric vehicles. And how quickly this happens varies by region and depends on several factors, but principally the annual driving distance and the electricity grid emissions intensity. So here in the case of plug-in hybrids, and for global averages, the payback occurs within about a year of operation relative to an ICE and early in the third year relative to a hybrid. Separating out the impact of grid decarbonization over the vehicle's lifetime shows that these points are reached quickly even without the positive effect of planned additional renewable electricity. For battery electric vehicles, those break even or crossover points occur in the middle of year two uh, and as with plug-in hybrids, early in the third year. Thereafter, the savings accumulate, leading to much lower life cycle emissions for EVs purchased today compared to ICEs and to hybrids, boosted further when we consider electric, uh, electricity grid emissions improvements over time. So the key takeaway here is that EVs offer emissions benefits today, and these benefits grow over time. In the step scenario, over a 15-year lifetime, a BEV is expected to produce half the life cycle emissions of an internal combustion engine and a PHEV or a plug-in hybrid reduces emissions by about 30 percent. As mentioned there are of course uh, regional differences however each of the regions examined in the analysis resulted in the same hierarchy. We all will also soon be releasing a life cycle analysis tool where you can interrogate the results uh, and the assumptions a little further. Thank you.
So I'm passing again to, to Tio. Thank you. Going back to batteries on a SCA perspective, this year we had a look on, we had a deep dive into the emission of batteries and how these change as a function of the battery chemistry. And as you can see from this slide, as a function of the chemistry you choose, the emission can change significantly, in particular LFP batteries has lower emission, about a third less, compared to high nickel lithium ion batteries, such as NNC811. High nickel batteries tend to require more energy intensive mineral processing than LFP, while the battery manufacturing step is more energy intensive for LFP, mostly due to its lower energy density. That means that strategies to reduce emissions footprint of batteries different, is, are different as a function of the battery chemistry and then need to be tuned accordingly. For both technology, improvement and innovation are expected to play a significant role in reducing the emission intensity per kilowatt hour. And here we assume an energy density increase of about 30% between 2023 and 2035 and a cathode acclimatic recycle content of 20%. And as a result of this, the emission per kilowatt hour fall by about 35% for both NNC and LF chemistry. And grid decarbonization, however, can play even a bigger role. It already plays a role, but can play a bigger role if further electrification is pursued. Today, only 20, 25% of the entire battery supply chain is electrified. And that means that there is space for improvement and emission reduction there. Finally, as I mentioned, battery recycling can also play an important role in reducing emission of all battery chemistry, but it has a greater impact on chemistry that have uh, that are mineral intensity, intensive like NNC811. But battery recycling is not only important for emission reduction, it's also pivotal to, be, to build sustainable and circular battery supply chains and mitigate critical mineral demand in the next day. If used fully, Current recycling capacity can allow recycling over 300 gigawatt per year. And this will grow almost fivefold from 2023 to 2030 if all announcements are completed in full. In 2023, also China accounted for over 80% of global recycling capacity, while Europe and United States were less than 2%. And this is set to change significantly in 2030, in which Recycling capacity in China is about 70% of the total, while in Europe and United States, it reach about 10% each. If all announced plans are built, however, in 2030, the world will have about three times more capacity than the potential supply for end-of-life batteries. And in 2030, two-thirds of end-of-life batteries will already come from EV batteries. Three quarters of these, however, comes from battery manufacturing scraps. In the short term, overcapacity could have important financial implications for recycling companies that are unable to secure stable source of end of life batteries that might result in significant consolidation of the market. However, the outlook could still change depending on whatever announcements translate into final investment decisions or not. Not, uh, not less, not less, uh, this does not mean that nascent recycling business, in particular in Europe and the United States, does not require investments and support. They do, because they are still nascent and just emerging in those, those regions, those businesses. In addition, building in advanced battery uh, recycling and developing the regulation and battery tracking system to recover and recycle as many batteries as possible is critically important and remains critically important to anticipate the rapid growth of retired EV batteries that they expect in the 2030s. And this is the case in which regulation matter, as demonstrated by the case of lead acid battery, batteries that have a significantly lower uh, uh, residual value compared to lithium batteries. But despite this, in, in, uh, in markets with good regulation, lead acid, acid, lead acid batteries are recycled almost 100%. That means that regulation can have an important impact on support. Um, for lithium ion batteries. And with this, I hand over to Elizabeth Connery for some closing remarks. Great, thanks, Theo. <laughs> so yeah, I know we're running out of time, but we did want to leave you with some uh, policy recommendations. So I have to admit, these aren't going to be so different from the, the ones we've said in the past, at least at the high level. 
But what we've tried to do with this edition of the Global EV Outlook is to shed some light on different aspects than we've addressed in the past. So uh, for example, with this first recommendation in terms of the level and type of support that should be provided for electric cars, we think it's important to understand both the price and kind of total cost competitiveness of EVs on the market compared to conventional vehicles. And so, you know, what we've seen in China was that they were able to gradually phase out their purchase subsidy without any noticeable disruption, given the growing price competitiveness of electric cars in the country. As mentioned earlier, uh, promoting EV sales in emerging markets is important, and, and this can include electric cars as well as two and three wheelers. Um, and so making those affordable, especially in terms of the upfront costs will be important. This could include measures such as providing low cost financing for EV purchases, and in the future, also by allowing imports of used EVs. Um, though, of course, you know, don't want to forget to mention that the rollout of charging infrastructure in these uh, countries will be essential to promote EV uptake. And I know we already have a question about that that we'll hope to get to later on. And then, you know, over the past uh, year, we've seen new emission standards for heavy duty vehicles adopted in the United States and the EU. Um, these are expected to help boost, you know, electric bus and truck sales in these markets. This type of measure and other measures uh, can support heavy duty vehicle sales and um, can include the introduction of zero and low emission zones, uh, different financial incentives for vehicle purchases and the support for heavy duty vehicle charging. And so this links to um, heavy duty vehicle and EV charging more generally. Uh, it's important to take of anticipatory measures to build out and upgrade grids before that becomes a bottleneck for EV adoption, especially given the long lead times here. Further, implementing smart charging will be important for reaping the benefits that EVs can provide for the grid, such as increasing renewable integration and reducing system flexibility needs. We've seen progress on this in the UK, which announced regulations in 2022 to ensure smart functionality of chargers as well as in China, where there's been a call for technical standards for vehicle grid integration. Beyond this, I should also mention that there are complementary solutions to grid expansion that can be explored, such as using stationary batteries and uh, battery swapping uh, to help mitigate local grid impacts. And finally, the EV transition will require building out new supply chains, uh, to which we've seen a lot of investment flowing already. We've shown that EVs purchased today offer substantial emission savings compared to conventional vehicles, uh, but it remains important for sustainability in a broader sense to limit the critical mineral and, and other material inputs uh, through innovation, battery and vehicle right sizing, as well as recycling. And, and the last point about recycling is just, you know, it's important uh, to, to have a good understanding of where these vehicles and their batteries will reach the end of life to ensure that there are facilities available where that occurs. And so with that, um, I'd like to thank you for your attention and we'll take uh, maybe a quick pause to review the questions and, and then start the Q&A. Thank you.
Thank you everyone for your, for your patience. So we received quite a few uh, questions and so uh, we'll distribute them uh, between colleagues. But just before we start, I'll just remind the audience that online, in addition to the reports, both reports, the, the EV Outlook and the Battery Report, you also have a data explorer as well as a policy explorer in which you can actually dive into some of these data points a little bit further if there's things that we're not covering in this presentation. Um, so we'll start just with some clarifying questions um, from, uh, from the audience. And uh, there is one question asking whether uh, the energy storage demand is, is cumulative or, uh, or is it annual demand? And I, I think Apollo will hand that one to you, but I think I'll hand over a second one to you, which is about our outlook and just generally our thoughts about vehicle to grid technologies we've seen in the press and I've seen recent announcements by car makers. And so uh, Matteo is asking in the chat what our view is about vehicle to grid technologies. Um, do you? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Zamatis. So on the first point, like in terms of six-fold increase on energy storage, it's installed capacity, so it's, it's cumulative numbers on that. And regarding now the vehicle to grid, so I mean, what we have seen is that first of all, that batteries in general they are facing difficulties on properly value them. So one of the bottleneck that we see that for vehicle to grid that it's not expanding. First is that consumers, they don't have the signals in order to, to get the incentivize that in monetary terms in order to, to, to offer on, on this services market. So this is one of the bottlenecks that we see. Secondly, we see that some of the, a lot of electric cars that don't have this capability itself. When we looked all the different models globally, we assess that less than 1.5 million electric light duty vehicles, they have the capability for vehicle to grid. And of course, there is an issue about warranties and degradation, potential degradation of, of batteries. But even if with 1.5 million, which are capable today in order to, to offer vehicle to grid or even vehicle to, to build to building uh, services, we have assessed that we're talking about 130 gigawatt hours capacity, which is more than two thirds of the storage capacity that it exists on the on the on the power sector. So of course there is big potential there, but what next around how you proper value the service that consumers are going to serve and also to release and to last more and more models that they have the vehicle to grid capability and also on the last point about having the proper infrastructure at buildings in order to 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 serve and to be able to, to enable this vehicle to, to buildings. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Apo. And actually, I, I suggest we continue somewhat on, on batteries, but potentially switching back to electric vehicles. I, I think I have a couple of questions for you, uh, Theo, in, in the chat. Um, there's one specifically asking why the, the manufacturing of batteries, the emissions associated with manufacturing, is higher for LFP than for, for the nickel chemistries. That, that's one I think quite interesting to, uh, to answer part of the life cycle uh, analysis. And then there's also another one where, you know, last year in the past few years, we've talked a lot about innovation in batteries, <clears throat> new chemistries such as sodium ion. And a few years ago, we, we also talked a lot about solid state. Do you, do you have any comment on, on that and whether we consider these innovations as, you know, taking a significant share looking forward? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Jean-Baptiste. So for the first question, the answer is, is pretty straightforward. The reason is that LFP has lower energy density, in particular at the material level. So that means that when you produce a battery, you can figure it out all the steps. So you take your material, you mix all together, you cook it in an oven, basically. For generating a certain amount of kilowatt hour, you have to produce more tons of materials. That's just because the energy density is lower. And then as a result, you, uh, you need more energy to produce that tons of material. So considering that our numbers, manufacturing-wise, is normalized as a function of kilowatt hour capacity or energy, if you prefer, uh, at that point, the uh, per unit of energy, LFP requires higher energy uh, compared and then higher emissions compared to uh, NNC. Concerning the chemistry, in particular, solid state and sodium ion, they are definitely the two most uh, important innovation at the moment happening at the moment in the battery field, but they target very different applications. So if we look at sodium ion batteries, 
the main advantage of sodium ion batteries is that it does not rely on lithium. So in, in particular, in moment of peak price of lithium, that can be a very important competitive advantage. And it can potentially, as a function of the chemist, exact chemist use, it can potentially need less or no critical minerals like uh, cobalt, nickel, or, or manganese. So one first important advantage is this potential lower cost compared to incumbent technologies like electric. That, however, strongly depend on the cost of lithium. So the, the advantage of sodium battery will strongly depend on, on the cost of lithium. And it can tackle applications like small cars or stationary storage. Solid state batteries is a different story. Uh, the main challenge of solid state will be implementation into the battery pack. So accounting for the technical challenges of it, like the expansion of the battery pack with high stack pressure that need to be applied, one order of money to tires and batteries and different manufacturing industry. But the, the objective of that would be tackle high energy density application, and that could be very important, for example, for heavy duty trucks, electrifying heavy duty trucks. Uh, so in that sense, we do see significant innovation, but contrary to sodium ion, that is more or less a drop in technology, sodium ion, uh, solid state requires more efforts for, uh, for manufacturing, and then it might require more time to be put in, in scale and need to be demonstrated is uh, efficiency and, and real world applications. Thanks, uh, Theo. I, I see that time is running out, so I, we will still take a couple of questions, uh, but I will ask the, the, the people from the team to, to try to answer in just a minute or so, so that we can cover as many questions and, and uh, feel free if you have other questions, of course, that, that we cannot answer today to send them via, via email. So I think there's a question, um, Quite important about charging in emerging markets, um, and I wonder whether Shane, you would be able to share uh, your your thoughts here. The the, the question in, in particular is wondering whether charging will be a bottleneck for uptake in, in emerging markets. And after that, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll go to to you, <laughs> Jules. There's a question on affordability and people wondering why uh, the the premium for uh, for some vehicles is the same over time. Uh, specifically uh, for SUVs in Europe in, in this case. So first Jane and then Jules. Okay. Um, absolutely, this is a risk, but I guess um, the fact that we have so much foresight on this allows us to plan accordingly. So when we look at these emerging markets, we expect them to rely on public charging more so than in the US and Europe. And um, a recent uh, study, for example, from India showed that 55% of people had access to home charging which means that, as we demonstrated in the slides earlier, maintaining that ratio of vehicles to chargers, uh, keeping that number low, is crucial for building confidence in the technology. So when we look at our step scenario, the public chargers are expected to increase 30 fold to 2030 and over 60 fold to 2035. So a huge, huge growth. Uh, and this explosion in capacity is only matched by the increase in EV stock. So for sure, it's a potential bottleneck, but because we have a lot of visibility on the problem, we can learn lessons from other markets and we can apply them. Uh, I think it, it should not present a, a huge issue um, for, for growth in these markets. Thanks, Jane. And, and now to usual, there, there's a question. So why is the cost parity between IC and EV sort of constant over time, specifically looking at European SUVs? Yeah, specifically looking at uh, uh, the European market, um, we know that the SUVs are, being, are getting the most competitive segments in Europe for electric cars but their price actually decreased uh, in absolute terms uh, when, when their affordability, uh, whereas their affordability uh, didn't move uh, a lot as compared uh, to the ICV. So we really have to weigh those two trends. We have this decreasing price uh, for the electric vehicles, for the electric SUVs in Europe, but as compared, I mean, with respect to ICE, that didn't move a lot because the IC SUVs also experienced uh, a price decrease. And that is because the cars are basically getting bigger regardless of the powertrain. And IC uh, vehicles is more and more getting bigger. So the, the mass market consumer is uh, tur turning towards um, uh, the, 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 the IC SUVs as much as uh, he is turning towards uh, the electric SUVs. So this is essentially due to the increasing competition um, within the uh, segment of SUVs, regardless uh, of, uh, of their powertrain. But we do see uh, uh, a decrease in the uh, electric vehicle price for this segment. Thanks, Julie. And there's actually another question in the chat about SUVs, and we don't have time to get into it so, so, so closely, but the question about what types of policy instruments can be used 
uh, to address car size. And, and there's a, an entire section in the report where you address that. So I welcome you to, uh, to go there. But as a final question, I, I had one for, for you, Elizabeth. I think it's about people wondering what's the, what's the rationale behind our outlook to 20 to 30, right? There's people being concerned in the press and so on. And, and yet it looks like our forecast or rather projections are, are, you know, are steady for robust growth. So could you maybe touch on that, you know, the rationale for this growth? Sure, great. Yeah, I mean, I think we mentioned earlier that we don't see kind of slowing growth. Uh, we see healthy growth, you know, it might be slowing, but we don't expect it to be exponential forever. So the first thing is to say, I don't think we're particularly concerned about the trends we've seen recently. Um, and then the, the main point I think about our scenarios and in our stated policy scenarios specifically, you know, this isn't a forecast. It's really based on, you know, understanding what current policies and market trends mean for the future. And so policies may change. Um, there are things that could happen. So it's, it's not a forecast, but it's a projection. And so um, there are a couple of reasons, of course, though, why our, our projection in the stated policy scenario has increased. And one of the, the main policies that was introduced over the past year is in the U.S. So the, the, the U.S. has um, uh, EPA had their final rulemaking for our new greenhouse gas emission standards for cars and, and medium duty vehicles, as well as trucks. But for cars particularly, that's why we're seeing um, our, our outlook for cars grow there. And I think the other thing to mention too is in terms of the market trends we've seen, you know, there's been impressive growth in some of these um, emerging markets that we mentioned and in China and the growing affordability leads us to believe, you know, there's strong uh, trends there as well. And so maybe we'll, we'll leave it with that and appreciate all the questions today. Thank you everyone for joining. Um, thank you Arafari for introducing uh, this session and to the full team and congratulations to everyone for at this work. Please do uh, send us an email if we couldn't answer your questions. Uh, and uh, again, I welcome you to go on the website where the report is freely available, as well as a data explorer and a policy explorer to delve more into these topics. And if some of these things you would like to hear a second time tomorrow morning, we're hosting a second uh, session of this, of this webinar, uh, which is another opportunity perhaps to, to delve into some of these concepts. Thank you very much and uh, have a good rest of the day.